I will call the uh, September 12, 2022 meeting of the City of Evanston's Administration and Public Works Committee to order. My name is Jonathan Newsma, council member from the 4th Ward, uh, chairing the meeting this evening. So welcome everybody. Um, we have a, a massive agenda uh, at this committee meeting and also uh, later tonight at council. Uh, so I'm hoping we can get through this uh, fairly expeditiously, and if we can bring this plane in before 6.30, we can be on time for our connecting flight. So let's move forward, and I will entertain a motion uh, on item AM1, the minutes from August 8th. I move. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? And. Uh, that motion carries. Let's also really quickly back up and do a roll call uh, because Council Member uh, Burns is planning to log in online if he hasn't already. So, uh, Council Member Reed? Here. Council Member Kelly? Here. Is Council Member Burns online yet? Uh, should be joining us soon. Uh, Council Member Newsma, I am present. So, a quorum of this committee is three. Uh, we are good to keep going. Uh, moving on with public comment, uh, Deputy Manager Stonebeck, we have two folks signed up for public comment. Yes, Francine Allen, Allen is in person, and then Michael Vasilko is remote. Is there anybody else here that wishes to uh, address the committee this evening? Recording in progress. If not, we will start with Ms. Allen. Thank you. And I'll give you a generous two minutes, Thank since there's so only much. two folks fast as I can. Hello, you all know who I am and why I'm here. Thank you again for your hard work over the past 18 months. I know each of you would advocate as much as I have if you were in this situation. Many of you and Peter, Peter Braithwaite contacted me directly and were appalled at what I've gone through. Those who contacted me said they could not pay the $45,000 if it were their house. The city needs to help and has the resources to help. If this happens to any one of your constituents, by passing this resolution, you can now say you help helped rectify this financially disastrous situation. Please note the original resolution has been modified to include several additional conditions homeowners must meet. These additional conditions were presumed, presumably added to further limit the city's exposure. But also please remember Director Stonebeck's analysis of the last six years of sewer repair data showed the average cost to the city would have been only $25,000 per year. One of the new conditions, Section 3, will impact those homeowners least able to pay for an extraordinary sewer repair cost. The new requirement will increase the amount a homeowner will be responsible for paying by an additional $5,000. Now, the first $20,000 will need to be assumed by families who already have problems paying the first $15,000. In my case, I spent close to $5,000 to diagnose my sewer before I had to pay the $45,000 repair bill. My total sewer bill is actually $50,500, but I never asked for assistance with the initial $5,000. If you are now requiring a $5,000 loan, my new total out-of-pocket expense is $25,000. $5,000 to diagnose, $5,000 loan, 15,000 homeowner responsibility. This is still far more expensive than a typical repair on a typical side street. A loan is an out-of-pocket expense if a lien is placed on the property. Please note the other new requirement added to the resolution will limit financial assistance to only homes with the total estimated market value of less than $540,000. This provision impacts the most vulnerable homeowners, low-income owners, new owners, and seniors on fixed income who have owned their homes for years with much of their net worth wrapped up in the appreciated value of their home. Um, please approve the resolution, but please modify it to delete Section 3 and consider deleting Section 2, Condition 4. Thank you very much for the support of this resolution. How would I do? You're good. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Basilko, are you online, sir? Yes, sir. <clears throat> you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to say, even though I don't think he's in the, well, he is in the chamber. Good. I just want to say that I want uh, Luke Stowe and his new position as city manager to succeed. And I think uh, his staff and the city council should do everything they can to 
make his job a success. Um, I know I'm going to try and do my best to also assist. Tonight, though, I want to speak about two things on the bills list. Um, one is uh, really on page two at the very top. It speaks of field use fees, recreational field use fees for James Park cricket, uh, for the cricket field, I guess, but it's, it's really not fees. They're, they're maintenance supplies. Uh, there's pitch resurfacing and field marking totaling about $9,000. So I, my point is this should not be listed as some kind of a, of a fee. This is construction repair work. And I, I feel it's kind of a hidden cost uh, buried in the, uh, in the bills list. Second item, um, I hate to keep bringing this up, but no one else does, uh, Robert Crown Community Center. Once again, I think this is monthly. I have to go back and look, but I believe every month there are uh, invoices for industrial refrigeration, repair and maintenance. Uh, and this month it's in the total of roughly 15, well, $14,533. I mean, if you run that out over a period of a, of, of a year, that's, I mean, being conservative, that's $150,000. I have to question whether or not the equipment's in actually good shape or not. This brand new building that we bought. Um, what I don't see on the bill's list is any reference to the uh, Robert Crown um, study, I guess, that I expected and I heard about from uh, Dave Stonebeck uh, for the uh, West Jane uh, Elsner report, they were going to go out there and, you know, review the documents, review the field conditions, review, I guess there's also both cracked glass of some kind, but I don't see that on the bills list. I'm wondering where that study stands. That's uh, two minutes, Mr. Vasilko. If you could wrap uh, up, please, you, sir. You, you, you didn't give me a warning. This is my warning. 15 second warning. Okay. Uh, so I don't see any mention of that. And I also don't see any mention of a transition, a meaningful transit transition from fossil fuel use by the city to non CO2 emitting fuel. This is something that has to start showing up every month at these meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else wishing to uh, address the committee? I don't see anybody, so we will uh, keep going. Uh, the rest of the items on uh, this evening's agenda are all on the consent calendar. The idea here, uh, given the, the scope of the agenda, is to get through this fairly quickly. Uh, but if council members would like to take items off of consent, uh, please I, let me know. I think, uh, I think I can make the motion. I think I might have agreement here that I move the consent agenda minus item A8 and A31. I'd like to add A12, A14, and A3. Hold on, A8, and Council Member Reed, you said A31? Yes. And Council Member Kelly, which items are you removing? Items A3, A9, A12, and A14. And is there one, is there an item I'm looking for? Is there one about the uh, report on the use of pesticides? That's A30. And has that been? I was going to pull that if okay, you great. didn't do the honors. So we'll. A30. Uh, we have removed A3, A8, A9. I don't think there is an A9. Or maybe I'm missing it in my packet, but. I've got an A9. That's the uh, the business district. Uh, oh, then I do not I'm maintenance the clean team. Uh, so A three, A eight, A nine, A twelve, A fourteen, A thirty, and A thirty one. So yeah, and I would like uh, sorry to pile on, Chair, but A three. Um, a3. There was a bid, if staff can help me out, there was a bid where um, two or three of, of the contractors who initially uh, applied did not um, 
proceed with the interview. At least that's what it looks like. It said not available. Um, the staff know which one that is. Is that A6? Deputy Manager Stone. And then while, while they're while they're thinking about that, A8. Uh, A9 was already a move, move removed, right? Uh, A9 has been removed and, and A8. Okay. A8 has been removed. Okay. You got A3, right? I said A3. Yeah, we you got that one. A3. Council Member Burns. What was the uh, the project you were talking about? It, there was one. Um, let me see if I can check my notes real quick. I was hoping somebody would just immediately know. Hold on. Um, well, he's checking his notes. Can we recap what is removed? So A3. A3, A8, 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 A9, A12, A14, A30, and A31. It was the um, the electrical system re reliability project if we can remove that one a5 also removed okay uh so just to recap we are removing items a3 a5 a8 a9 a12 a14 a30 and a31 uh council member reed if you'd like to accept a friendly uh, amendment i accept uh, and it's been seconded by Council Member Kelly, I do believe, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, since Council Member Burns is participating remotely, I will call for a roll. Uh, Council Member Kelly. Uh, Council Member Reed is going to stick a thumbs up. Uh, Council Member Reed indicates in the affirmative. Uh, Council Member Burns. Uh, aye. And Council Member Newsma, aye. So the. Uh, Consent agenda with the exceptions of items A3, A5, A8, A9, A12, A14, A30, and A31 passes unanimously, bringing us to item A3. If someone would like to make a motion on item A3. Um, so moved. And there is a second from uh, Council Member. It's been properly uh, moved by Council Member Kelly, seconded by Council Member Burns. Um, any discussion on item A3? Uh, this is an agreement uh, with Tesco and Associates for consulting services related to Mason Park expansion and the Church and Dodds Transportation Improvement Project. Um, I have questions, but uh, Councilmember Kelly, I don't know if you were going to start. You can start if you want. If you would like. You can go ahead. Um, okay, so. First question is just trying to understand. Um, there was a mention of, of, I think three phases of work started at one A, I think, and went to one B or one one C. But I'm just trying to get a clear sense of, um, you know, what we would be authorizing today and what those different phases are. Is is my first question, and and specifically what work would happen at each phase. Thank you, Councilmember Burns. Members of the committee, my name is Laura Biggs. I'm the city engineer. So um, this project is divided into multiple phases, as you mentioned. 1A is a public engagement and conceptual design part of the project. So um, this area, had, this project is pretty open-ended about what could be involved in it ultimately. Although we have received through the no cash bid process at Cook County, we received a number of parcels of land. How that land is utilized is limited by the fact that it is currently an old railroad berm and is also has high tr capacity transmission wires over it. Um, but there are many thoughts about how Mason Park could be expanded into that area with or without leaving the berm in place and with different uses under the power lines. And for that reason, the public engagement piece of this is really important, but also could dramatically change the direction that we go for preliminary design when we really start narrowing down what three concepts look like. And so that phase 1B is once we have general consensus from the public 
um, and the surrounding area, what we're doing, we will then present more specific concepts about what that looks like. When that is decided about exactly what is going to be there, we will move into the phase two final design, which is producing contract drawings and phase three. I'm sorry, just so I can keep up, sorry. Um... Laura, is that, are we in 1B was more specific concepts and then now you're talking about 1C, am I following, tracking correctly? Yeah, so for okay. example, one idea, um, consultants proposed a number of things already just in sort of a brainstorming way and staff has also had some brainstorming. One idea would be to leave the berm in place and have like hiking trails through the berms. That's very different when you start narrowing in on, con on the concepts and providing multiple options within that than if you remove the berm and you just have flat parkland with different kinds of park amenities that are more traditional. So phase 1A is sort of discussing high level, what do we want this area to look like? And then once we get a pretty decent consensus on what we want it to look like, we will narrow in with multiple conceptual plans of that area of the approved design. And then once we get to, this is specifically um, what amenities we want, this is roughly how we want it located, the public's weighed in and said this looks like a great park design, a great use of this land, then phase two, they will produce construction documents that can be bid. And, phase, and then phase three, which is construction, the consultant will um, oversee some of the work that is happening in the construction phase, which includes processing submittals, making sure the right equipment is installed, checking the site periodically to make sure that the contractor is actually um, completing the work in accordance with what the construction contract says and um, issues like that, helping us with payment applications. Thank you, and I have, have two more questions on this item. Uh, second question, is um, I would imagine there's a reason why we uh, uh, why we are splitting the how we fund this. So it looks like there's 30k from 2021 capital bonds, and then the remaining amount, at least in this first phase, um, will go through the West Service and TIF. Um, why not all? Um, why don't why wouldn't we just use the TIF for the the, the total amount? Um, what was the thinking behind splitting the 30k off? In 20 when we prepared the budget for 2021, which was actually in August of 2020, staff was directed not to use the TIF, but to provide um, thirty thousand dollars to begin some initial planning work. And that work actually did not occur because of staffing limitations. And so the bonds were sold, however, to be directed to that project. It is okay. feasible to redirect them to another project and use only the TIF funding, but we are trying to use up the bond funding that the bond was sold specifically for that. Okay, and the final question on this item, and thank you, Laura, is, um, so we all know the West Evanston, um, you know, the West Evans and TIF prim primarily was meant to uh, generate funds to, um, you know, redevelop or make improvements in the old defunct um, uh, uh, railway, uh, the Mayfair cutoff, which we're discussing today. And, you know, and again, we can discuss this more offline as well, but is there a, is there a possibility that we can expand this, especially some of the research, but or the, yeah, some of the research to include other parts uh, of the Mayfair line? You know, for example, you know, undergrounding um, high power transmission lines is, is certainly something that we need to investigate for this project. But you know, I would say all along this uh, the Mayfair line that is that falls within the West Evanston TIF. Uh, we need to be doing similar research uh, and investigation. So, is 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 it is it possible that we can expand the scope of uh, this contract at a later point without having to go back out, you know, through the bidding process? Yes. Okay, that's all, Chair. Thank you. 
That's my word. And I just want to clarify that you did have another question earlier. Tonight we were proposing uh, to award the services for phase 1A only, uh, and then we would come back to council when we took the next step. Yes. We, um, we reviewed qualifications for this team to provide all of the services necessary through construction engineering. Um, and so we do not need to go back out to hire another team, but the next phase of the contract we would come back to award an amendment to change the, to add the additional phases of work. Great. Councilmember Kelly. Thank you. Um, so has there been any um, public engagement to recently around this or? No, we would hire a consultant who would help us prepare to the information needed to really run a public engagement process. So that would be another consultant to move forward with a public engagement process? No, this no. consultant will prepare the information okay. for the public engagement okay. process. And do, you, do we, we don't know how that will look yet, what that, for how, what the plan is or the structure for? Um, typically we have uh, an initial meeting with the public where we provide information including um, exhibits that show what is out there currently, what some of the concerns might be, and, and like in this case, just talking about which le properties we acquired and are being debated as part of this project. And then <clears throat> the consultant would also provide just some like brainstorming stuff. We could do this, we could do that. Here's some pictures of what a hiking trail might look like. Here's some pictures of what, uh, you know, a tennis court might look like. You know, just like a general, really high level, here's some ideas to work off of. And then we'd have a meeting where the public would be able to just propose um, their thoughts and what they would like to see. And then the consultant takes that back and they work that through that, and then they s kind of make that appear into exhibits that people can look at. And they say, here's what we heard last time, and here's some ideas about how that might look. Is this what you guys were thinking? And then um, people give feedback on that, and then we typically have a third meeting, usually this is a three-meeting process, where we narrow down to, here's the ideas we want to approve, and we want to move forward with. And then once they get to like some specific ideas to move forward, then we repeat it, but just with those ideas. Thank you. And I'm just wondering, and maybe Councilmember Burns has some thoughts, um, like just sort of an initial listening meeting. I mean, I know what was in 2005 with the West End plan, residents came together and they voted against, you know, removing the berm. Um, so I, it just, it seems to me um, that that would be advisable in terms of making this move smoothly to just have sort of an opening, an open um, discussion, just hearing from residents about the area. Um, and can you address how this interfaces or works with the master, with the West End, West Side Master Plan? Does this? Um... So I think that's something we would um, discuss a little bit in the public engagement. The West Side Master Plan did um, talk about potential to put in housing and, and uh, various other things and kind of some of the same general area. And that's something the staff has discussed. But um, the West Evanston Master Plan, while we're not trying to ignore it, is um, happened many years ago. And so we wanna make sure that we are capturing the thoughts also of the people that live in the immediate area now. Great, thank you. And I know um, safety is one of the, um, reasons um, mentioned here for moving forward on this. Is there, I just, I haven't seen, is there sort of um, a report or evidence of, of safety issues in this area? Um, this was more anecdotal that was presented by uh, council member Braithwaite to us, um, but then he and I walked the site and we looked at it, and in fact, um, there are some concerns about basically just having a wooded area that doesn't have a designated path, but where people have placed all sorts of stuff. 
Um, and anecdotally, he's told me that there's been safety issues for high school students accessing the school. Okay, but nothing like concrete in terms of reports with regard to safety. I do safety. not have that. Okay, um, thank you. That's all. And Chair, I have one more question sure. if I could be sure. recognized. Let's, let's keep this, let's wrap this up fairly quickly here, but go ahead, Council Member Burns. Yeah, so I just want to um, double down on what I said and just make sure that I understand the process to, um, uh, to, to that would allow us to include um, other sections of the Mayfair line, you know, if and when necessary. Would, do I need to make an amendment now to allow that at a later point, or is that something that we need to be bring back later? I just, I want to, or is, it, is that an amendment we, that the city manager would have authorization to make it at, at, um, at a later point? Uh, Council Member Burns, I think that we would need to meet with you to, to uh, solidify what your concept is. And once okay. we have an understanding of that, we would go to the consultant and ask them uh, for a cost estimate to do that okay. additional work. And then we would have to come back to the city council through APW to uh, award an amendment to perform that scope of work. Okay. Got it. Thank you. That's all, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Laura, I have one quick question, uh, kind of following up on Councilmember Kelly's question. So we're spending on item A3 some money on Mason Park and planning for Mason Park. Item A4, which we approved on consent, is a, a, a more general park and green space plan. So how would uh, what the money we're proposing to spend on Mason Park, would, how would that fit in with the, with the overall plan? So I think the overall planning effort is, a lo is different. It's looking at things much higher level. So a popular topic we talk about quite a bit with the Parks and Rec Department is the need for pickleball. And we, we have um, relatively few options for this in the city. It's a if constant thing. Pickleball. So, But I mean, that's just one item out of many things. Um, and so the goal would be to capture more big picture, like what should we be doing? How much money do we need to fund our parks and facilities? Um, that are recreation related? Should we be making changes in direction? Great. All right, I will ask uh, Deputy City Manager Stonebeck to call the roll on uh, item A3. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Bringing us to item A5, if somebody would like to make a motion. I will move item A5. Um, oh, that's one of the ones I don't have on my agenda here. A5 is the approval of an agreement award with Greeley and Hansen for the water plant, uh, 4,160 volt electrical supply or electrical system reliability project. So moved. It's been moved by Council Member Reed, seconded by Council Member Kelly. Is there any discussion on item A5? Uh, Council Member Burns, you had asked for this one to be removed. Yeah, and I, and ex I expressed the question earlier, too. I, I, I just noticed, um, if my notes are correct, that there were, seemed to be two contractors that um, did not interview. They, they initially applied but did not interview, which I believe is the last, last step uh, uh, in the bidding process. So I just wanted to know um, if you know why, if we know why they, did not, they chose not to interview. Members of the committee, Laura Biggs, city engineer. Um, it's pretty typical that when we uh, solicit proposals through a request for proposal or request for qualifications, we do an initial scoring on a variety of criteria that are generally um, the standard for the city of Evanston. And out of that, you will have two or three um, companies, vendors that really show that they scored better, they had a better understanding of the proposal, they were more qualified, they've done this type of work before, and then you'll have people that naturally sort of float downward for a variety of reasons. And so those people that are selected as the top contenders are shortlisted, it's, which is an industry standard term, and they are typically interviewed by staff and detailed questions are pro proposed by the staff to make sure that they have a thorough understanding of the team's capabilities. And so it just so happened that on this particular project, 
Greeley and Hansen and CDM Smith were considered the shortlisted firms. They scored significantly higher on the written proposal process and were selected to move forward. And I do want to add, this is nothing to say about the general qualifications of the other firms. It's just how they presented themselves and their qualifications and their understanding of this particular project and what their fit was for this project. Yeah, I guess um, it, it seems like there's a lot you can learn uh, during that interview. And I, I guess I just wasn't, um, I didn't know that some people weren't even invited to interviews during the bid process. I guess this is just a new development for me personally and my own understanding of how it works. So, um, but basically if, 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 uh, if, if, if certain, you know, contractors that seem like they scored that there's, there's a, a big difference between the high scores and, and everyone else, um, they're, they will be the only ones invited uh, for an interview. Is that basically how that works? Um, yeah. Because it's unlikely that the people who score lower will be able to make up the difference by an interview alone. Yeah, and typically um, it's a significant uh, financial investment for a consultant to prepare a proposal, but for them to prepare an interview about doubles their costs usually over mm. the preparation because they're asked to prepare a 15 minute presentation related to the, their qualifications to the project. And then um, they bring a number of people. There's typically three to five people that they bring, staff members. There's also um, typically five to seven staff members that sit in on an interview. So an interview takes about an hour. So it's a pretty costly thing for both a consultant and for the city staff for every interview that's had. And then the last question on this item is, what is, is there a formal way in which someone can be debriefed uh, if they, you know, let's say one of the, you know, contractors that, that was not invited for an interview, you know, wanted to um, schedule a meeting so that they can, you know, learn more about, uh, you know, the matrix or the scoring matrix or, or why they received, um, you know, certain points and is, is there a, is there a formal way in which someone can do that? Yes, they usually reach out to purchasing. And once the purchasing process is over and the procurement is finalized, it is not uncommon for people to request a debriefing through purchasing. And then they usually meet with the engineering staff in the case of a capital project. Um, we love to help people improve their proposals because we want to have as good a competition as possible for the future. So um, we're happy to meet with people and give them feedback on what we were looking for that um, wasn't present in their proposal. Okay. Um, and is that is that something that is, is offered or is it's like only upon request or is it part of like the email that they get at the bottom? It says, just like with FOIA, it says like, if you want to appeal this decision, you can reach out to blah, blah, blah. In this case, if you want to learn more about why you score what you scored, you can, you know, request a debrief. Is it something that we're, um, that we're offering people and, and kind of advertising or is it only upon request? It's upon request. Okay. All right. That's all, Chair. Thank you. All right. Anything else on A5? Seeing no further questions, uh, Deputy Manager uh, Stonebeck, if you could call the roll. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Item A5 uh, carries unanimously, bringing mm -hmm. us to item A8. If somebody would like to make a motion on item A8. I move uh, item A8, approve contract award with Flader Plumbing and Heating Company, uh, Bills Plumbing and Sewer Incorporated, Joel Kennedy Construction Corporation, and Pan Oceanic Incorporated RFQ 2245 for private side lead service line replacements. Is there a second? It's been properly moved by Council Member, uh, uh, Council Member Reed, seconded by Council Member Kelly. Uh, Council Member Reed has uh, the floor. Yes. Uh, so I appreciate staff for coming back with this. I think there are a few uh, items that uh, make sense for us to 
uh, flesh out. And given the length of this meeting and the fact that we have council coming up, I would like to just table this uh, for uh, two weeks. Councilmember Kelly, does that sound until our next meeting? Yeah, I'd like to table this to our next meeting and uh, be able to discuss this offline and come back with the proposal. I think I really appreciate Ms. Allen and her advocacy uh, throughout uh, this, and I think some of the just to clarify, A8 is lead service. My line. apologies. Yeah, I was confused. The okay. other underground stuff. <laughs> this yeah. is the underground on the way in. In fact, so I do not table this. And uh, Mr. King, welcome. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, if I, re I remove this from the agenda, my apologies. I remove this. Uh, no, I, re I removed a. I think multiples of us removed it. But uh, Council Member Burns, if you have uh, concerns about this. Uh, uh, Council Member Burns, uh, if you have some questions on A8. Uh, Daryl King is here to address them if if you need. Them. Yeah. So uh, first question is, will we? I, I think this is uh, through 2024. Is the is the, is the plan to go out? Um, um, is, is the plan to seek additional qualified uh, contractors in 2024? I'm just trying to understand what happens um, in 2024 once once this is over. Uh, Chair Newsma, members of the committee, uh, good evening. Daryl King, Water Production Bureau Chief. So uh, during 2024, or as this uh, contract would conclude, yes, we would uh, request additional um, contractors that could propose or pre-qualify for this type of work. And then um, when when water, when the the I know this is for emergency replacements, but we also do replacements um, when the water main fails. What is the, are we using a similar process to identify uh, contractors um, uh, in those situations when the when we're replacing lead, lead lines as, uh, after a water main fails? Is it a similar process or different? So during a, when you say when a water main fails, are, are you speaking about a water main break? It's my understanding that we are, if, if we are scheduled to make improvements on a water main, that while we're there, we also are looking to replace the uh, lead water lines. Is that correct? That's correct. So for it's, example, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. And so, um, so my, my question is when we in those situations when we're um, when we're replacing the private side, how are we doing that? Or is, are those the ones that we're, we've we have a, another contract with a company that's helping us do that? I'm just trying to understand how are we identifying those contractors? So when does the homeowner identify though that contractor? So in terms of our uh, water main, our annual water main replacement projects, contractors are allowed. Uh, to bid on the project based on specifications that are drawn up by a consultant engineer. Uh, so contractors would bid in that way. Um, if, it's, if it's a private side only contract, again, uh, go, go ahead, David, you had something you want to add. So on the water main replacement project, we make it a requirement of the contractor replacing the water main to also replace the lead service lines that are connected to the water main. So it's, it's all the same contractor uh, scope of work. The contractor may elect to subcontract out the, uh, the lead service line replacements, but that's, that scope of work is all included within the water main replacement contract. And, and it has to be in a way in order to get the new water main uh, in service and uh, disconnect the old water main. It would not be advantageous to allow multiple different contractors the ability to replace the lead service lines. It would impact the water main contractor schedule uh, to coordinate it. So uh, that's why we leave it all to the water main contractor uh, to develop his schedule for water main replacement, including the lead service lines that are connected to that water main. 
But what we're voting on tonight is is only for the emergency repairs. So tonight's award is to pre-qualify four plumbing contractors. And believe me, this is the second time we went out and we did uh, a lot of engagement with local Evanston plumbers who unfortunately only one submitted a bid. The other two did not and we made them well aware of the opportunity on the second time around because we were hoping that they would bid. We're not sure why they did not. But this is only for emergency repairs and this as we develop our workforce development, the, the other the workforce development crew will replace the public side of the water service and the plumbers that we're hiring will replace the private side of that water service that needs repair. Um, and, and real quick on the water main one, brief quickly, is um, that same contractor that's repairing the water main, you're saying would, would replace both the public and private side of the lead service line? That is correct. That is what's okay. currently taking place. Okay. And, and then um, going back to um, the emergency uh, um, repairs, the, you know, so we created the workforce program for the public side. Um, the, uh, the, the initial idea, my, the initial deal for me was really to, to do both the public and private. We stopped at public um, because what I heard from, I think it was you, Dave, or staff, is that, um, is that we're, not, we're not trained. There's no city of Evanston employees in the water department that are trained to do the private side. But, I, but we always still talked about having a workforce, having some workforce component that would um, make it easier for contractors replacing the private side to still hire locally if they could. And so have we thought any more about, about how to achieve that, even on the private side? Uh, on the private side, you would have to be a licensed plumber to perform that work. And okay. uh, we do not employ licensed plumbers right now in the city of Evanston. It is something that we could look into. Uh, it, it will become challenging because plumbers are in very high demand right now. So we could look into that, it, but it would be something new. And obviously, I think that once we get the public side workforce development up and running, then we could definitely look at the trying to engage something for the private side. But I think we don't have enough staff to do all of it all at one time. No, and I meant more so um, that contractors would, um, I, I meant more so that contractors would look to find work on um, on their own, not that it would be something that the, you know, the city would lead on or would employ any additional people beyond our, you know, the workforce program that we're creating for the public side, but more so uh, encouraging contractors that, uh, you know, that, that are repairing the private side of the lead service line to try to find local laborers or, or in, you know, Evanston residents to work with if they could. But I'll, I'll talk to you more about that offline. Um, sure. And that's now that we know what, what four contractors were pre-qualifying, <laughs> we can definitely reach out to them directly and encourage them to uh, work with our, uh, our development, our workforce development coordinator. And if he has a list of them, uh, Evanston residents that are interested in becoming plumbers, we can share those names with these uh, contractors that we're pre-qualifying today. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, that's all, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Burns. Any other questions on item A8? Uh, seeing none, uh, can I request uh, that we move to voice votes, uh, which is? We've got Councilmember Burns online. It's allowable. It's allowable? Yeah. I'll appeal to uh, our, our council. Can we have a, a voice vote with somebody participating online? Roll call is preferred. Let's just do a quick roll call then. Council Member Kelly. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Item A8 passes unanimously, bringing us to item A9, uh, approval of a contract award to Street Plus for business district maintenance services. Uh, if somebody would like to make a motion. So moved. 
It's been properly moved and seconded by Council Members Reed and Kelly. Are there any questions or comments on uh, A9? And I'll recognize uh, uh, Paul Zamelzak. Yeah, Paul, do we have the uh, the contractor uh, ready to uh, make a short presentation on this? Uh, we do, Council Member Newsma, if you're wanting that. Uh, as long as it's not too long. Uh, I've, I've coached him to speak no more than five minutes. Would be great. Great. Um, Mr. Hillard, are you available on the Zoom? Uh, yes, I am. Great. Thank you. Mr. Hillard, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity to uh, give you a little bit of background about our company. My name is Steve Hillard. I'm uh, the president and principal of Street Plus Company. We are a national provider of clean, safe, and friendly services to improvement districts across the country. Uh, we've been in business since 1991, and we're the only privately owned and operated firm uh, in this space uh, as we speak. Uh, currently, we operate in 14 states uh, with about 90 districts as our customers and employ about 650 ambassadors. Uh, we really specialize in providing uh, cleaning services, uh, hospitality, safety, security. We also do social service outreach, landscaping, uh, as part of our uh, our business that we provide to organizations and cities uh, like Evanston. Uh, in this particular uh, situation, uh, we responded to the request for proposal uh, with a formal proposal uh, with we outlined the work that we would do, uh, the parameters of which we would do it, the pay rates and the bill rates and the actual task that the individual workers would do. I think it's important to note that during this process that Street Plus is committed to hiring local residents in the Evanston area for these jobs. Uh, we also are looking to uh, use, uh, when appropriate, uh, individuals that are considered second chance employees for these jobs. Although this is not a workforce development program, we are open to looking at a percentage of the full-time workers coming from that type of background. I think that uh, the one thing that we're excited about providing services in Evanston is that we have a good footprint in downtown Chicago. Uh, we provide services for the for the Chicago Loop Alliance, and we also were awarded uh, contracts with the city of Chicago with the mayor's new initiative with grant money to make Chicago uh, more safe and friendly downtown uh, since the pandemic and the civil unrest that occurred last year. So uh, we've been with the Chicago Loop Alliance for about 10 years now, and we provide a wide range of services for them and we're looking to expand that services to your organization and your city uh, in the near future. Uh, I'm available for any questions anyone might have uh, related to the formal proposal. Thank you, Mr. Hillard. Uh, the chair will recognize Councilmember Reed. Yeah, I have a few quick questions. Uh, one, I'm just curious, what, are, what is an average wage for uh, one of the street workers? What we're proposing for this particular contract is starting out the cleaning ambassadors at $16 an hour with a full benefit package. Okay, wonderful. Um, and uh, and are these typically full-time, part-time? Uh, this would be all full-time workers, and we're proposing seven full-time workers to fulfill the contract requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then uh, this is not for you, Mr. Hillard. This is more so for staff. and. I, I, mention this to Luca. you know, I love her downtown. I uh, want to make sure our downtown is clean and fully support this, but also I've got a business district in the south end of town that borders with Howard and uh, uh, both uh, 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 manager Stowe and I and uh, uh, manager as well. Uh, uh, Zamelzak and I have walked down Howard and there's, you know, it partially I don't want to blame it all on the border. It's easy to just blame Chicago. It's Chicago. The trash is blown over from Chicago. Uh, but, you know, we, we have our fair share of uh, need on Howard Street especially. I think it's one of the more needy districts uh, uh, in Evanston. I'd just love to see some of this expanded to getting, uh, making sure Howard Street is clean and attractive uh, for, for visitors. And, in fact, today I walked down Howard and uh, – saw some of the stuff that we're concerned about downtown, some of the human waste uh, out on the street. So uh, would love to see Howard Street included in this. And Chair, just for the sake of time, uh, I think Howard Street is included in this, correct, Paul? Let's let Paul uh, answer that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also ask Mr. Hiller to weigh in on this, but the, the uh, uh, Council Member uh, Reed, the, um, 
the primary focus will be downtown and in in some ways Main Street, although Main Street will be under construction next year. And then we would cycle through the rest of the districts. I think Central Street needs the least amount of work, so they'll not get as much attention. But I think Howard Street would probably be kind of I'd next to see it in, in a similar way, if, if Main Street was a priority and it's not going to be a priority, I'd like to see Howard Street be that uh, a secondary priority. Right. I would ask uh, Mr. Hiller to describe how he would cycle um, his staff into the different districts. Absolutely. Uh, in response uh, to the RFP and part of our formal proposal, uh, Howard Street would receive about 3.25 hours daily of services from the existing staff of seven. And Main Street from uh, Hinnon to Maple would receive 1.75 hours weekly of basic cleaning services. So they are included. Uh, it's broken down as a percentage based on the number of block faces that are uh, in the area that's requiring the additional services. Thank Did you. that answer your question? Councilmember Reed here. Yes. Anything further? No. I have questions. Uh, oh, let's okay. go to uh, Councilmember Kelly and then Councilmember Burns. Thank you. Um, yeah, a couple of questions, and I'm sorry I didn't send these earlier. Just um, by the time we get these, there's not always enough time to ask all the questions. But so, you know, we're looking at hiring an outside contractor basically to pay folks, you know, a decent um, wage. Um, with insurance, um, but we have like part-time jobs posted. I'm just wondering if we've looked at, for example, and I'm looking at some of the, the details that these workers would be assigned to. For example, we have a part-time parking enforcement um, post per, uh, position posted. Would it not be possible to look at cross-training folks to do some of those jobs? For example, the parking person could also clear snow maybe and get full-time along with benefits. Our child care workers, um, you know, we aren't we aren't doing the same thing in terms of full time insurance for our child care workers. A child care worker could potentially be cross trained to work at the library, um, you know, shelving at the library and make them full time. I'm just wondering, as I see some of the details that these workers would be cover our own workers here, I wonder if we could, if it's worth taking it, pausing and maybe looking at those part time positions to make them full time and cross train. Just and again, I apologize for asking this right now and not. Um, Shooting you that question before. Sure, uh, Councilmember Kai, I wasn't. Sure. That sounded like an idea more than a question. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I, I I will say that we're we're looking at this particular uh, funding for one year, and, and and during that time, perhaps we build that program. I I, I feel like we're trying to address an immediate need with an off-the-shelf solution that we can quickly respond to the uh, community and the business owners' complaints about the cleanliness in our districts. Um, I think the the ideas you just outlined are possibly doable. I don't know enough about the staff. Um, I could try to ask for help from uh, Deputy Manager Stoneback in terms of how we would approach that, um, allocating other staff members to this kind of thing. That would be great. I just think we have a lot of part-time, and we could do better by our own employees, making them full-time, and I think many of them could be cross-trained to, to handle a lot of this. May I jump in and let's, have uh, Director uh, Stoneback answer? Let's ask the related question. It, yeah, it's, 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 right on, it's right on here. So I, I do wonder, you know, if you can also answer that from a lens of what Councilmember Kelly is saying, but also – why not just bring the staff on instead of, you know, just create new full-time positions and why not just bring the staff in-house rather than contract out where there's that profit buffer uh, that we could eliminate and keep some of this money in-house? Right, I can answer that. I can answer that as it relates to the proposal that I've put before you, and that is uh, it's off-the-shelf ready to implement um, with experience and um, coming highly recommended from other business improvement districts in the region. Um, we felt that the need was urgent. Uh, we've been, um, I think we brought this before the council last May or you know May of 2021. So it's still an ongoing need, but I would say that we could do that. We could build a program around with using city staff. We'd have to hire the staff, train the staff, and, and kind of perhaps copy the, this kind of initiative and do it in-house. We're not ready to do that today. I don't know how long that would take, and I don't know what the process would be for that. 
And if I may jump in, this is actually something that uh, Audrey Thompson and I have discussed as well. She has a plan that we would create a, a workforce development for young adults similar to what we have for the youth that we have during the summer. But we're, she's interested in starting up a program that would be for young adults. And we <clears throat> discussed potentially starting that next year and not so much in the, for the business districts but to help out clean up parks and, and a lot of other areas in the city that we need it. And if that became a, a, a good, viable opportunity, then in year two we would switch potentially from this service to uh, using permanent employees for the city. <clears throat> but uh, piggybacking on what uh, Mr. Zolozak indicated, this is something that we want to get out and do right away uh, help the downtown and all the business districts try to recover uh, from the COVID and, and bring people and make Evanston an attractive place to go in all the business districts. And that's why we thought this would be a great way to get the, the program started this year, actually kind of learn from what they're doing and then potentially start taking it over with city employees in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the part-time employees and cross-training them to do other tasks is something that we would have to, to work with the union with as well. I'm not sure that, you know, uh, somebody that's doing a part-time job, some of them prefer part-time work because they have other life obligations. Uh, but, yeah, we could definitely see if we find a match, work with the unions to see if, if that type of dual type of work is something that they'd be acceptable to or not. A great suggestion that we can look into. Thank you. Councilmember Thank Kelly, you. No, you that's else? all. I just okay. think there are many part-time workers who would like to be full-time and receive the benefits, and our child care workers especially, so many of them are part-time earning low wages. So so thank you. I appreciate yeah. your looking into that. I'll weigh in with, with some comments and then a question uh, for uh, Mr. Hillard. I do think that the idea of bringing this stuff in-house at some point really makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I also I believe that we really have a, an immediate and pressing problem that needs attention sooner rather than later. So getting this launched with an organization that does this all the time is the quickest way to uh, address the problem that currently exists. And th that buys us some time to figure out, uh, you know, moving forward if we'd want to bring these services in-house. Uh, so I'm fully supportive of this tonight. Uh, I do have a, a question for Mr. H Mr. Hillard with regards to the scope of services that you provide. And if you could clarify um, where the, uh, you know, where you draw the line at, at social services and interaction with individuals on the street uh, experiencing homelessness or uh, other uh, community members that might be in distress. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the scope of services really doesn't cover a in-depth social service outreach specialist program, but rather our local manager that we would hire would receive additional training provided by Street Plus to be able to do effective evaluation of those on the street in need in the regard of engagements and then potential referrals to the various agencies that are in the area that are in place to provide services for those in need. So uh, that's the role they would play. Our cleaning ambassadors would be trained also in the basics of homelessness uh, to include why people are homeless, uh, also would be how to engage and treat them with respect. And if there was a situation where they were uh, interacting with those individuals, they would know who to call to refer them to additional services. We have a full element uh, at a lot of our programs where we have a workforce development element and we also have licensed social service workers that are on our staff as ambassadors and that's all they do is engagement referrals case management uh, of those individuals on the streets in, in need of services so that is potentially a service we could add to this contract but it's not included in this current contract that's correct. The only piece that's included in this contract is the additional level of training that our manager would have to effectively understand what the issues are and to effectively refer those individuals to existing agencies and city departments for help. Got it. Thank you. I think moving forward, you know, whether it's uh, through this contract or through another organization that we contract or in-house, 
being able to offer social services with licensed uh, individuals um, is something I would like to pursue moving forward, but that's not part of this contract. So uh, if there are no further questions. I have questions. All right, Council Member Burns, please go ahead. Um, okay, now let's see. It. Oh, yeah, so one, I, and I, I brought this up, I, I think, in one-on-one -on -one conversations, and it got lost, but I would like to add, um, and, and hopefully I'll have Council Member Kelly support, but noise to this contract. Um, noise Street gets a lot of activity. The Maple Noise area gets a lot of traffic and activity, and I would like to uh, add that to this contract. Mr. Zalmosak, if you'd like to address that. Yeah, we, we should we should definitely have that in the contract. I apologize for the oversight on it. Thank you. And then uh, secondly, the I want to go back, circle back to the social um, uh, and that's Maple Noise, too, just to make sure I'm, I was clear on that, which Maple is a much smaller area, but Noise is the main area, but Maple Noise. Um, so social outreach coordination. So I think it, I saw in the packet it says 75, um, 1,000 is what that full-time uh, social outreach position would, would cost. Did I did I read that correctly? Yeah, that would be fully loaded with uh, wages, payroll taxes, benefits, equipment, and support. Yes. Um, and tell me a little bit about support. Uh, the support about yeah, the support would come from our corporate office. We have a group of individuals across the country that uh, are part of our social service peer group network. And so they meet on a regular basis to share best practices across the country. Uh, we have uh, the licensed social service workers in major metropolitan areas to, to include Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York City, New Haven, Connecticut, Raleigh, North Carolina, Reno, Nevada. Uh, those, into the, those, those cities have a dedicated outreach program that we provide to them and we have a regular meeting. Uh, the outreach workers would also be uh, involved in the national organization uh, for uh, continual education too, uh, which is the su additional support. And then, so this would, and you, you, I'm glad you said that. So this wouldn't be like a licensed social worker, but a, a peer is, is what you said, correct? So likely someone that has a kind of a direct lived experience with homelessness or housing insecurity or, or maybe something else, but is my understanding yeah. of peer that they can, they're more, they can speak from experience as they're working with, uh, in part our homeless population. Yes, and also it, it, depending on what the customer uh, and what the scope, to the, the scope and uh, services are, uh, sometimes we, do, we we hire individuals that are unlicensed social service workers that are in degree programs or in a, a continual education, have real life experiences, or were homeless themselves before, and we hire them as unlicensed social workers. And we have another element that's licensed social workers, so it'd be a combination of, of both. So you can offer both. Okay. Um, yes, I, I would like to and and. You know, uh, hopefully I'll have support on this, but I, I've certainly heard enough, um, you know, from uh, residents downtown to know that is is a greater work um, as, as Trilogy is doing. And I think they'll continue to do that work. Um, I do think that we need to um, I, I do think we need to uh, increase our effort down. <laughs> The dog disagrees, I guess. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm at home. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, I do think we need to significantly increase our effort. And while we are piloting this program, I would also like to pilot either a licensed social worker or at the very least to have an unlicensed uh, peer support, somebody that can speak um, from experience to um, uh, to add another presence downtown that in this you know, individual can, um, I think, seamlessly work with Trilogy. What I like about this position is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this this person would be full-time assigned to Evanston, right? That's correct. They'd be assigned right. to the downtown business district. And uh, yeah. we, we have a, a contract with the city of Burbank, California, where we provide citywide outreach through a vehicle with two social workers. So I <laughs> so certainly can give you some recommendations on people to contact to validate the the effectiveness of the program. Yeah, and so I, I would like to make that motion. Again, we can work out whether or not, is there a Second. difference between licensed and unlicensed? No, if I think you, cost? I think there might've been a mix up just point of information. I think when I think when you heard peer, he was talking about peers 
amongst the licensed social workers uh, when he mentioned the peer-to-peer -peer program. Is that correct, Mr. Is it Hilliard? Am I saying that right? Uh, Hillard. Hillard, sorry about that. Is that is that right? Is that what you meant by peer? Yeah, what I mean by that okay. is they, they also would have peers that are not in our network or employed by us, but they'd be members of a national professional association for social service workers. And we also have our own in, in, in internal peer-to-peer, -peer, both licensed and unlicensed uh, uh, groups that I actually coordinate and support and uh, sponsor. And but when you mentioned unlicensed, I thought you talked about people with lived experience um, potentially being a part of that unlicensed group that could, that, that may, uh, um, you know, work out for this type of a position. That's correct. We have many okay. individuals across the country that are unlicensed social service workers on our behalf that are employed by us that are out providing that work. Okay. Yeah. So I would, um, you know, I, I make that motion that we included. We can, you know, oh, and then my question was, is there, I mean, I would imagine there's a difference between licensed and unlicensed in terms of salary and, and cost. Yes. What is the difference? <clears throat> Uh, I'd have to look at it a little bit further, but I think that the, obviously that the main difference is that we're paying a higher wage if someone is degreed and has a discipline right. that is uh, verifiable versus someone that's not. So the, the primary difference would be the actual starting wage. Okay, so and, uh, I would like to leave some, some wiggle room so that staff can go back and figure out what works best. But again, if, if we're going to pursue this um, in a pilot period, I think based on the amount of feedback we've heard, um, it makes sense to not wait on this and to, to take action now to, um, to increase our effort downtown so that we can provide, so we can make contact with those that need it and, and, uh, and provide them with the, um, you know, the support that they need. And uh, I, I would like to make that motion. Uh, Council Second. Member Burns, before we move forward with that, uh, if I could ask uh, Manager Zalmazak to address that concern and what does that do to our contract? Have we done the homework on that uh, that would allow us to make a fully informed vote tonight? Again, I just, real quick before you go, I just, I want to, as I said, leave some rooms that would allow staff to go back and investigate it further and have that conversation. Yeah, I'm not so, saying that staff has to approve, uh, has to expand this contract, but we should, we should uh, authorize them to have those conversations. And if, if they feel like it's a good fit for our needs, so, um, if I'm understanding, make forward, if I'm forward. understanding your motion, Council Member Burns, it is not to expand the contract in front of us to add seventy-five thousand dollars to include these services. It is to authorize staff, request staff to uh, have some additional conversations and come back to us with a proposal. It, it, am I understanding you correctly? No, because I, I think the I think the work is, I think we've already been fully briefed on this type of work, whether it's licensed or unlicensed. Again, we have trilogy. You've had trilogy on more than one occasion. Speak directly to the council. So I think the the work is similar to what trilogy and, and other outreach groups do. And so what I would like to do is is increase it up to you know one hundred and twenty five thousand, let's say, just so they have the room to not only investigate this further. Um, but to also, you know, move forward if they feel like it's a good fit for us. Paul. Okay. Thank you, um, Chair Newsma. So there, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. We can approve the contract as is tonight and with a commitment to come back with these additional services that we can vet, do a little bit of research to compare what other operations are providing. Um, as originally planned last year, we the staff was recommending that we have this level of service, but at the time we were developing this contract and the, and the concept with Trilogy, um, so we, we backed off of that as a, as a service. Um, again, because I'm confident with kind of this off-the-shelf solution that Street Plus is offering, they have a ton of experience in this realm. I think they are probably offering what we need at the right price, but I'm not prepared tonight to say, that, you know, we're getting our bang for our buck on that. I need to spend a little bit of time with it. So perhaps there could be, with Deputy City Manager's help, could we approve something up to an amount and then come back, or do we come back just for that service to append or amend the, uh, the contract? Councilmember Burns, I think you'll find the committee amenable in 
uh, conceptually to what you're proposing. Like we'd like to add social service uh, support to the street, but we probably don't yet have enough information to make a fully informed vote on exactly how to proceed with that tonight. So what and, I would- And again, I wanna, be, I wanna be clear because we have a, 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 a media um, wait, waiting, <laughs> waiting in the, uh, you know, on the side to, to write about this. So I want to be very careful. What I've said is, is that we approve an up to amount. And if they, after the investigation into other programs, similar programs that if we don't, if staff does not feel like it's a good fit, then they do not have to move forward with it. But what I'm saying is, is that I think that we've heard from the community enough about the concerns We've investigated. We all know, uh, we, we, you know, Councilmember Newsma, you and I, and Mayor Bish with Justin Oak Park visiting another shelter there in their community and talking to their mayor. We know all across the area there has been an increase in um, in, in, in homelessness and aggressive panhandling uh, everywhere across our area, um, which in and of itself is not an issue. The issue is that we have not uh, responded in the way that we need to as the city to help uh, make contact with individuals and to get them and to direct them to get the support that they need. And we've heard that we've heard that enough. We know that this is an issue, not just in Evanston, but it's facing, uh, you know, our area, generally speaking. And again, we've heard a lot from Trilogy about how these programs work. We have a committee that have investigated these types of programs. Like, so we know enough to, at the very least, be able to prove tonight up to amount and again, I trust staff to go back to investigate this further to see if it makes sense to move forward with with uh, with this uh, uh, group. And if it doesn't, then they don't spend the money and then they come back to us with a different proposal. But if they do like having um, not just someone from a, a kind of one off, you know, a separate organization out there, but somebody that's net networked in not only with the cleaning crew that has their own training, but also that community that, that uh, Mr. Hiller talked about, then I think we should give them the authorization today to move forward. And that's all I'm saying. May I comment? I, I understand. And uh, before we move, move forward, uh, Deputy Manager Stoneback, are you wanting to weigh in? May I make a comment? I've been waiting for a long time. Okay. So um, I would not advise that we move forward tonight. I think, you know, one thing is cleaning the streets, another thing is social services. And I have been researching um, programs across the nation. I have a meeting, um, Council Member Burns, and you're welcome to join the conversation tomorrow with directors of the STARS program in Denver, um, which is based on the Eugene uh, Cahoots program, but it's actually taken it even further. And this is actually staff that's been hired and their program has been expanding and it's been incredibly successful. So I would say no. I mean, cleaning streets, one thing, even that, I have some questions about in terms of data and why we need to add this, but I do want to support it because yes, I agree, we need to address that immediately. But this is so important. We're talking about humans um, and delivering appropriate services. I would ask that we wait. And again, Council Member Burns, if you'd like to be on that call with me tomorrow with the um, directors of the STAR program in Denver, which I think is one of the um, a leading program right now um, in addressing these kind of concerns. I'd be happy to invite you to that call. I mean, to, to me, that sounds more and more potentially like infringing on, you know, or duplicating the work really, truly that Trilogy is already doing, yeah, as, as opposed to having a, a full-time person, again, assigned to that downtown area to make contact with individual, individuals and directing with services. So I'm going to uh, still make my motion. <clears throat> if folks want to uh, vote it down, that's fine. Um, I tried, and I will communicate that to yeah, the people uh, that are in contact with Council Member Burns does have the right to make that motion, but uh, like the motion in front of us is to approve a contract as outlined in A9. Council Member Burns, what you're talking about isn't part of, isn't necessarily part of this contract and certainly not part of the contract as proposed. So what I think I would do, suggest, if it makes sense to everybody, is to have a vote on item A9. And then if Council Member Burns would like to continue this discussion, uh, as chair, I will uh, hear that discussion under items uh, for discussion, which is later on in this agenda. We could have a separate motion so after I would like passing to items item chair, I would like to make the amendment, Chair, to this item. And if it gets voted down, it gets voted down. We're in a democracy. That's, that's more than fine. But I would like to make the amendment to this uh, item, increasing the budget, 
by $125,000 that would allow staff to have a discussion um, with this organization to see if it's a good fit. If it's not, great, but if it is, they'll have authorization and the approved dollar amount to move forward. If, if I that can, is my motion. If I can jump in here, I, I, I uh, want to, we have a long agenda, but I, 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 I get council member Burns's uh, motion and I, I get because it's a sense of urgency that we really need uh, to start or start doing uh, work and, and supporting our, uh, you know, homeless population in the downtown. Um, so I get this sense of urgency, but I'm also hearing what my colleagues here are saying is there might be, you know, no offense to Mr. Hilliard or, you know, his group, but there might be a better group locally that can handle this. And we want to explore the full range of options. If we're going to spend 125, 150, whatever it is, thousand dollars, let's make sure we're getting the best contractor. And so I would support this coming back if staff can turn this around by our next meeting and and have uh, some kind of proposals before us and some dollar amount uh i i think we'd all be supportive of that yeah and again i just want to so, be clear everything you just said i agree with the only difference is is if they come back and they say look the best the, the, if they if they make a decision that this is the best route that we can take they'll have the authorization to move forward so i'm, I'm we're talking about the same thing in terms of being able to investigate not only this program with other programs they still have that ability to do that let, they let also me have to move forward on in, this in the interest of time let me let me ask if there's a second to uh, council member burns's motion there is council member burn uh, council member reed has seconded uh, uh council member burns's motion is there any discussion on that motion council member Kelly? Yeah, yeah I would just I like to say that 125.2 is such a random amount. Um, you know, I have looked at costs in other cities. I mean, I just think we're just throwing out that amount because that's an amount that this particular firm would add on to the contract. So, I, you know, I, I can't support that. Um, but what I can support is, you know, to your point, to have staff look at, to um, Council Member Reed's point, to have staff look into this, um, assess the program that is offered through street clean or street wise street street plus street plus um yeah. and and report yeah. back to us at right. our next meeting um about it all right that so would be let's great. uh if there's no further discussion on the amendment to increase the amount up to one hundred twenty five thousand uh, dollars, i will call a vote on that amendment council member kelly no council member newsma no council member burns Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. And with a split vote, Chair, does this get forwarded with a neutral uh, recommendation to Council? I am going to uh, look to yes. the legal that is Council. Correct. It does get forwarded with a neutral recommendation. Thank you. So now you vote on the original. Okay. So as amended, uh, if I could restate this and correct me if I, uh, if I this am not, not. If, if what I am about to say does not reflect Council Member Burns' understanding, because we did not uh, ask to reduce that motion to writing, but uh, we will authorize uh, city council, or city council will authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Street Plus Company. Uh, in the amount not to exceed uh, $633,257. Uh, $633, uh, that is $125,000 more than what was uh, 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 in our original motion. And, and, and I guess my request for this is for staff to, obviously you're gonna do due diligence on this and if this turns out to maybe not, I would encourage you to still just in, interrogate all of the options. If this so happens to be a really good option, then you have the funding to just move forward with it. If not, then at the next meeting, bring back a, a number of options for us to consider at around, you know, 125 to 150,000, not exceeding. Yeah. So that is, uh, that will, uh, item A9 will move to council with, uh, with that stipulation, assuming we vote it on it and pass it. Uh, so I will ask uh, for that roll call now. Council Member Kelly. No. Council Member Newsom. Aye. 
Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Item A9 passes as amended, uh, moving us to item uh, A12, which is the approval of a purchase order increase for open studio project uh, to provide art programming at Robert Crown Center. So moved. Uh, it's been moved by Council Member Reed, seconded by Council Member Kelly. Uh, is there any discussion on item A12? I think I held this just um, and perhaps this can't be answered now, but for a future meeting, I would just be curious. I feel like we're, I'd like to know the uh, expenses for maintenance and for running Robert Crown versus what we're spending in programming. Um, but I don't expect that answer this evening, but maybe for the next meeting. Um, I'd just be, just like to see that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm concerned in terms of also like what we're allocating for programming at Fleetwood and others. And just to overall, it'd be nice to see um, some of those expenses thank you just point of information isn't programming typically in the parks and recs budget and then maintenance would be in facilities and, and I say that only just uh, there might be a easy way to do this accounting I, I'm not sure that I understood but the way you explain it maintenance is yes it would be in a separate thing separate account. I'm not sure that, uh, as you're aware, that we have the specific facilities maintenance costs at each uh, community center. But this is a programming but, fee. It's kind of unrelated to capital expense, unrelated to maintenance. Right, but Whether I just, because I know we're spending a lot <laughs> on maintenance annually. I mean, when I looked at the bills pay list for Robert Crown, I just thought it would be helpful to see, um, just to get an idea. Okay. to the value thank you so staff has noted that request uh, seeing no further discussion on item a12 uh, director Stoneback if you could call the roll councilmember Kelly aye councilmember Newsma aye councilmember Burns aye councilmember Reed aye and now uh, item a12 passes uh, unanimously for moving us to item a14 which Finally, is this is this is what I thought we were at at a8 okay yeah. I move resolution 63 r22 recognizing the public benefit of the city paying private sewer repair line costs in excess of $15,000 per repair for a residential property. Second, it's been moved. Item A14 has been moved by Council Member Reed, seconded by Council Member Kelly. Uh, is there any uh, discussion? Council Member Reed. And especially now, in the interest of time, I will move to table this uh, in, until I think we should have enough time over the next two weeks to, to, so I move to table this to the next regular meeting of the Administration Public Works Committee. I second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to, type, to table item A14, this being a standing committee council rules do not Yes, yeah, so table, so, so it be an actual roll. Do we need, so we need a vote to a table vote on this. Yeah. Um, so if you could call the roll, please, sir. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Nay. Council Member Burns? Um, aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. By a vote of three to one, item A14 <laughs> is uh, tabled until the next meeting of the ANPW committee. Bringing us to item A30 with uh, seven minutes to go. Uh, item I-30 is, uh, is accepting a report on sustainable pest control and pesticide reduction. Uh, if we could have a motion on that. So moved. And is there a second? second. It's been moved by Council Member Reed, seconded by Council Member Kelly. Is there any discussion on item A-30? Yes, Chair, I have, yes. Council Member Burns. Um, this is the only item I didn't get a chance to really review. So can someone, um, can staff really speak to this? Good evening committee. I'm Emily Okalau, public services coordinator for the public works agency. Emily, you have the floor. Go ahead. All right. Um, so this is a report of uh, pesticide activities um, according to the sustainable pesticide reduction policy that the city passed 
Um, and this is a report that is meant to be issued every two years. Um, I came on staff in February of 2021. Um, so this is the report effectively from 2018 through 2021. Councilmember okay. Burns, do you have any additional questions? Um, I do, but in between meetings, I'll uh, I'll review it. Uh, is this does this go to council? Is that what's next? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll hold until council. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, Councilmember Kelly. Um, yes. Thank you. Hi. I appreciate the conversations we've had regarding neonics, and hopefully, we're moving forward on making um, extra sure that we aren't. In fact, purchasing trees um, from um, places that are using those. Um, and I had a question regarding, uh, it says that the pesticide report says that the city applies MWRD biosolids on athletic fields and at the LAD Arboretum. Um, is that, I think, I, I believe that there's some issues from what I've understood with some of these um, biosolids in terms of with MWRD specific biosolids or biosolids yeah, in general? Yeah, I just, with PFAS is in, included in these, and I don't know if this is something that we've looked into. Um, I don't know if we've looked into this more recently. Okay. Okay, well, if we, just for next time, I, you know, I don't know. Sure, correct yeah, right we'll now. make a note to look into that. That would be great. And then um, I also had a question I know with our, oh, what is it, the um, mosquito abatement program. Um, so in the, I know way back in the day, you could just call to be, be omitted from the spraying, but now it seems like, well, I think it's been going on for a few years, but it's, it's sort of an arduous process. You have to get a doctor's letter and everything else. Is there any chance that we could look at making it more um, accessible so that residents could just opt out more easily? Uh, yeah. Just, okay. David. I think it's a separate. Good evening. I don't believe that they are spraying at this point in time. What they are doing is uh, treating drainage structures and known locations. Uh, so they do not spray for mosquitoes anymore. They uh, try to kill them in the in the larva state. So there's no more spraying at all. So opting out isn't even a isn't a thing anymore. Correct. They okay. they do not spray. They notify us when they come to treat drainage structures and. Uh, some bodies of water that uh, mosquitoes might infest, but there is no spraying taking place. Okay. So I had a couple of residents ask me about the opting out policy. And um, point of uh, information that that's handled by a separate unit of government, correct? The mosquito? Yes, there's a whole separate yeah, agency yeah, yeah, that yeah. does that. Councilmember Kelly, I think you are looking at the same uh, information that I am, that we've received from some community advocates. So. I would suggest in the interest of time this evening, maybe we have some follow-up conversations offline to, to give some feedback to Emily and her department. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you. I yeah. will move uh, item uh, eight. So we need to vote on item oh, yeah. A30, uh, accepting in place on a file this report. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Council Member Newsom. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Moving us to A31, uh, accepting and placing on file a report regarding the future use of the recycling center. So moved. Properly moved by Council Member Reed, seconded by Council Member Kelly. Is there any discussion on yeah, this item? Just Council very Member quickly, Reed. with the two to three minutes that we have left, uh, uh, Ms. Biggs. Um, so it, it, so it, I think this is important for folks to know. So we started off with a huge number, uh, forty million dollars uh, to. Uh, make some improvements to the service center that we have here on Asbury. Uh, then, you know, we potentially went down to around $10 million uh, if we were to create a new building uh, near James Park. And if we were to move forward with this plan, which is to use the recycling center uh, for storage and make some modifications, that number is now down to like $2.5 million or somewhere around that? Uh, no, not quite. Okay. Um, so, committee, my name is Lara Biggs. I'm the city engineer. So the, um, the, there were a couple of choices for how to improve the service center, one of which was around $40 million and one which was more around the $23 million stage. And the $23 million included $10.5 million to build a new recycling center replace the cycling center by building a new storage building in James Park. 
Um, if we stay at the recycling center, that's two and a half million dollars. So now we're um, still at roughly 16 million dollars, 12 to 16 million dollars in improvements, but we're working on figuring out how to do things more cost effectively. Definitely two and a half million is better than 10 and a half million. Yeah. So there's an $8 million savings. Okay. Uh, I, 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 um, I, I think this is a really good path forward with the recycling center. It's, it's in the eighth ward. I, you know, I think some folks had some hopes that maybe a climbing gym or, you know, a, a brewery would be there, but if we can save, you know, millions of dollars and I, and I guess, uh, one thing I, I didn't get a chance to fully vet this. Were, were, was there an analysis in here uh, regarding, you know, what we projected we could get if we were to, uh, uh, if the recycling center were to, the former, the building formerly known as the recycling center, were to come back online, be owned by a private entity, pay property taxes, potentially generate sales taxes? Did we do a, a cost analysis? We did a very brief cost analysis. So uh, we estimate we could get approximately a million dollars for the building and then, and the property, and then $50,000-ish for annual property tax, which over a 20-year period is about a million dollars. So that's $2 million. We did not address sales tax because that varies so widely on what depending on the yeah. use. But essentially, um, to make up the ten and a half million dollars at fifty thousand dollars worth of property tax per year, would be like one hundred ninety years. Yeah, and and so the, the easy answer is to say it's better to use this building as is. And then I think even layering into this, if we were to go with this, uh, there's the animal shelter that's going to have some work done pretty soon. And I think it was also a possibility if we made some investments in this building, we could temporarily locate the animals there saving the taxpayers a bit of money on having to potentially locate the animals at another non-city owned facility. Is that also still a possibility? Um, so there's, there's two different types of animals, dogs and cats, and they have very, very different needs. So um, the cats are actually easier to relocate. They just need a relatively quiet space with um, a few amenities, dishwasher and laundry and so that can be done in a number of different places around the city it's pretty easy to find that location the dogs are very challenging they need floor drains they're very loud uh, with the barking so that's what we would choose to relocate into the recycling center whereas the cats might be a little bit more sensitive and stressed out by the noise of the public works operations there mm -hmm. wonderful and so that could still relocating the dogs would have been another expense somewhere out in the yes. city to find. That uh, is actually a very challenging problem that we were not having good luck solving. Okay, uh, well, uh, I think hopefully we've solved all, a whole bunch of issues and saved the taxpayers a bunch of money, and I think we're on the right track. Thank you. So if, uh, if we vote to accept this, are we, we're not formally approving any expenses. Uh, we're basically providing guidance that we do not want to uh, pursue putting uh, municipal storage at James Park, but we want to conceptually do that at the uh, recycling center. More discussion to follow as we pursue that line of yes, discussion. Yes, but in order to make it um, habitable for dogs for the um, animal shelter, that temporary spaces would need to be approved later this year, but there would be a s separate discussion about so that. Heads up, that work. That's so it would be a heads up, uh, but a lot of the money, okay. um, we wouldn't have to, we would be able to um, effectively spend money. Most of the improvements for the recycling center are the same as for the, using it for the dog space. And Deputy Manager Stoneback, you had a Yes, one of my yeah. colleagues made a very good suggestion that this should not be called the Evanston Public Works Storage Center because it's being used by Parks and Rec and Facilities Management and a host of different departments within the city, that it would be the Evanston Municipal Storage Center. Great. Any, I have no objections. Any that. further discussion on item A31? Uh, seeing none, uh, Deputy Manager Stoneback, if you could call the roll. Council Member Kelly. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. 
Item A31 passes unanimously, bringing us to the end of our agenda. Uh, seeing no further business to come before the committee, I declare this meeting adjourned.